Good morning, everyone. It's Lee Henson, President and Founder of Agile Dad, and it's time for today's episode of The Daily Stand-Up. Without any further ado, let's get started. It's Tuesday, and I received an email, thank you for that, from one of our subscribers who asked me to review an article that was recently published. The article talks about four Scrum Master success principles. And, uh, you know, it was a really interesting article. Stefan did a great job with it. And uh, I wanted to kind of take you in a direction to show what he felt were some of the things that were principles. And I want you to take note right away how many of these tie into the Agile Dad 12 Step program. Uh, it just feels like these marry pretty well together. So I thought that if you find some value here, that it may be a good opportunity or a good idea for you to uh, consider taking a look at uh, the 12-step program as well, because they do align quite well. So principle number one for Scrum Master Success is choosing Scrum for the right purpose. If you choose the appropriate application area for Scrum, that's one of the most essential things you can do. Uh, there's a matrix that's called the Stacy matrix. And if you look at it, it talks about where you're applying things, whether things are simple, good practices, complicated chaos, or complex emergent practices. And if you know where your projects lie, Scrum is best used in some of the complex areas. If things are very simple, there are normally much simpler ways to do things. A lot of people are leaning on lean and Kanban and just operational organizational efficiency, crank things out. But where empirical process control thrives is in that complex area where it's important to apply transparency, inspect, and adapt. And that's where you're going to see iterative and incremental improvement. And that's where you're going to be able to see a desirable outcome. This is where you're going to start focusing on outcome instead of output. And in turn, that's going to help you mitigate risk and help you build things that make sense. I wholeheartedly agree. I couldn't think of anything better. And by the way, for the record, that is number one on the Agile Dad 12 step list. So there you go. Uh, coming in next, uh, strive for high product quality. From day one, you should keep technical debt to a minimum and work continuously on high product quality, reflected in the Scrum Team's definition of ready and definition of done. Achieving agility requires dedication to product quality and excellence at the technical level. Once again, I couldn't agree more. I have two things here that I want to point out. One is that one of our principles is to focus on strong development practices principles and make sure that you have a... Uh, a practice in place where you have a development workflow outlined of how you're going to build things, what tools you're going to use, and how things are going to be structured. Um, and, and we have the same thing for testing, right? To make sure we have a testing artifact that shows how things are going to be tested. But And those are both principles, by the way, from the 12-step program. In addition, we have a whole, uh, a whole episode separate on technical debt and on Team John and how to tackle technical debt. And I think technical debt is probably the number one killer of business efficiency. If you can get rid of your debt load, it's going to help you focus on outcome. There are some really, really prolific companies out there who lead by example. And what they do is they take debt very seriously and they look at it as, is this something that has stopped the press is important enough for us to fix right now? And if it is, let's do it. If not, is it important enough for us to place the very first item in our next sprint? And if it is, we'll take care of it then. If not, this is something that gets known but not resolved and archived. And it gets reviewed before we do our next incremental update of a product release or the next update for our new product. And what will happen is at that point, we decide which of these known but not resolved issues do we want to address in the upcoming uh, release of our product or service. This is a very smart way to approach debt. The second thing these organizations do is instead of trying to chip away and say we're going to dedicate 10% of our time to debt or 20% of our time to debt, they literally hold a full two-week debt sprint. Uh, and they'll do it once a quarter or twice a quarter if needed, or once every six months, whatever it is they need to do, but they'll dedicate a full two-week sprint to doing nothing but debt. Now, identify the top 10 debt items they want to work on, and they'll just kill them. And what I can tell you is this is very effective, because instead of just dedicating a small percentage of one person's time, the truth is nobody ever does that. Nobody sits down on a calculator and says, what's 14% of my 5.896 hour day? You know, and nobody does that. So, and even if they did and they figured how much time it was, by the time they did it, they'd have to refigure because of the time it took to calculate. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is it's an endless loop, right? Uh, so make sure that if you have an understanding about debt, that you're taking care of debt accordingly. So once again, good call out. 
create, maintain an actionable product backlog. <laughs> Yay! This one is also in a 12-step program. So, so far, he's nailed five out of the 12 steps in his first three items. I love it. Garbage in equals garbage out. No matter how well your scrum team can perform, uh, you know, everything else is a substandard product backlog. Everything else in a substandard product backlog will, will diminish all the team's achievements. No doubt. No question. It would be best to support the product owner and developers to maintain a permanently actionable product backlog. Amen. And I just talk about the product backlog affectionately. In fact, there are two steps in a 12-step program that talk about the product backlog and product backlog organization and uh, making sure that the product owner has understandable, clear deliverables. So this is just incredible. Uh, and it has to do with refinement and it has to do with grooming and it has to do with taking action every single week. I say at least an hour a week that the team should spend with the product owner refining and, uh, and, and refreshing and making things doable so that by the time they hit sprint planning, they're achievable. And uh, you should avoid anti-patterns. And he says here, he's got a great article about 28 backlog uh, and refinement anti-patterns. I'm gonna have to go read that later. It looks pretty good. Uh, in addition, the last one he has here is embrace self-management and take it to the scrum team. Admittedly, this one's not part of my values. However, it's not part of my 12 step, but it is one of the things that I heavily talk about when we teach certification courses. One of the things I talk about is the definition that Ken Schwaber had when he said self-organizing, uh, you know, he said self-managing. And I think that, you know, here's the best explanation. And it's the same one I give. Restrain from solving problems that your teammates can solve themselves. If I have people out there that can solve the problem, I'm not going to enable them by solving the problem for them. I will empower them and give them all the things they need to solve the problem. And if it's something they can't solve themselves, I will certainly step in and resolve the issue. However, I don't want scrum masters or coaches to be enablers and to, you know, to cause the team disruption by solving their problem. It, it, everyone knows it feels good to be helpful, right? But it's not your job as a scrum master to be the team's helping hand in everything. I remember when I went and coached at one organization and the scrum master would say, I need more water. And developers would run up and go fill his water bottle. And I'm like, that's extreme, right? It shouldn't be that way, right? Or, or vice versa, you know, a developer couldn't hold up their water bottle and the scrum master shouldn't go run and do it. You, you can't have this type of anti-pattern. You can't have people serving a scrum master and you can't have the scrum master being that level of service to everybody else. But if there are obstacles that can be avoided you, or obstacles that can be resolved, you know, the team should take the first steps to resolve the obstacle. And if it can't be resolved, then uh, you know, it becomes a scrum master's responsibility. But I think the key here is the scrum master or coach needs to be a servant leader and a good role model for the team. And they need to make sure that the team has everything they need to be successful. And that is what they should be doing. That is what they should be uh, focused in on, honed in on, laser focused, right? So... It helps when you identify success principles of Scrum Master to take an outside perspective, to look at expectations, to look at what people are doing, and to simplify, to make things easy, and to figure out where you need to be. And I think the biggest benefit here is that as a Scrum Master, your job is to be like a doctor. So you should, and if you've listened to my podcast before, you've probably heard me say this, but if you're new, this is a good note. The scrum master is a lot like a doctor. They listen to all the symptoms. And then once they have all the symptoms, they make a diagnosis. And then once they make that diagnosis, they'll write a prescription. And then they give the prescription to the team. And it becomes the team's responsibility to take the prescriptions to the pharmacy, get the prescription filled, take the prescription as prescribed, finish the dosage, and uh, end up becoming healed from whatever ailment they had. It is not the scrum master's responsibility to drive the developer to the pharmacy, pay for the prescription, escort them to their home, pour them a glass of water, place the pill in their mouth, pour the water in, see to it that they swallow and do a visual check that the pill went down and repeat that process every day. I think you see where I'm going with this. One is a person who empowers, the other is a person who enables. And you wanna be someone who empowers the team as an agile coach or a scrum master. And I think that's the message here that great scrum masters empower their teams. They uplift them, they excite them, they motivate them. They get them charged, they get them high energy. And I think that's where we need to be. So I hope this was useful to you and I hope you learned a little bit more about scrum masters. And thank you, Stefan, for a great article. 
uh, and this was posted on scrum.org. So if you're looking for it, you can go find the article. But uh, it is an excellent opportunity for us to revisit, refresh, and decide what we should be doing. If you have an idea that you'd like for me to either review or something that you want to talk about here on a daily standup, we'd love to hear from you. Learn more at agiledad.com. Shoot us over an email. We'd love to take your article and make it one of the ones we talk about on an episode of the daily standup. As always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.